Right, let's do some songs from under the stairs, will we? Songs from under the stairs. This week, I excavated an old CD from 1995, and I got a terrible shock when I realized that 1995 is 25 years ago. Isn't that insane? It does not feel like 25 years ago. I went back and looked on the internet and looked up what was happening in 1995. So this might take you back. In 1995, Windows 95 was born. Does everybody remember Windows 95 with its amazing startup sound designed by Brian Eno? Let's, in fact, let's have a listen to that startup sound. I remember sending my first email in 1995, or maybe it was 1996, and I remember thinking, this will never catch on. It's ridiculous. I'm going out to write a postcard. In 1995... Clinton was president in the US, John Major was PM in the UK. In Ireland, divorce was finally and narrowly made legal. Seamus Heaney won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1995. Musically, the big albums in 95, The Benz, The Great Escape by Blur, Jagged Little Pill by Alanis Morissette, A Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness by The Pumpkins, Movies, what was happening in movies, Heat, Seven, Waterworld, Clueless, Ace Ventura, Casino. I mean, a mixed bag. The track that I've picked is a Radiohead track. It's off the Benz. Well, Fake Plastic Trees was the single from the Benz, and this is the seaside on the CD single. I listened to this song over and over again when I was about 19, because at the time it seemed to capture with real clarity that in between time you know when you're not quite an adult but you're definitely not a child anymore and the kind of uncertainty of that time the backing singer on this version is diane swan of the band julie dolphin they were supporting radiohead in 94 apparently and there's only one known live performance of this track with the full band and that was in 95 in japan Anyway, this is the song. It's Radiohead with How Can You Be Sure.
Now, I think this might be a good time for us to have songs from under the stairs. Songs from under the stairs. As it turns out, there's a kind of a link between the Horace Andy tune you just heard and the song that I have rescued from under the stairs this week. So for the first 19 or 20 years of my life, all I wanted to do was be a musician in a band. And we had a band in Cork City and we practiced and practiced and practiced, you know, in sheds and garages all over the city. And it nearly worked out. We did actually get offered a record deal, but then like millions of other bands all over the world, it just it didn't happen. But for a minute, it was the most important thing in my life and in the life of the other lads in the band. And back in the mid 90s, Massive Attack played in Cork City and we supported them. And at that time, we were also the resident band in a nightclub in Cork. And then after the gig, Horace Andy, who you just heard, who was singing with Massive Attack at the time, he came up on stage and jammed with us. I think we did Stevie Wonder Superstition. And that remains probably one of our only big claims to fame as a band. And anyway, we were all obsessed with this record that I'm about to tell you about by Billy Cobham. Billy Cobham is one of the greatest jazz drummers in the world. And this record has been famously sampled all over the place, but most famously probably by Massive Attack on Blue Lines on the tune Safe From Harm. I'm going to play you the original tune, which is called Stratus, and it must have one of the dirtiest grooves you'll hear on a record. It also has an epic drum solo, which is about five minutes long before the tune kicks in. So I'll just give you a taster of that, and then we'll get into the song. But there is a nice epilogue to this rambling anecdote. A few years ago, Billy Cobham was playing in Ronnie Scott's in London and myself and the drummer from the band Bob Jackson one of my oldest dearest pals we went to see him play and if you haven't been to Ronnie Scott's it's one of the most elegant ways to see music it's got that sort of jazz ambience it's got those little jazz lamps on the table and there's table service and there's everyone's no talk and it was an amazing gig and he played this tune
That was the sound of M. Ward with Undertaker from his album Transfiguration of Vincent from 2003. He does an absolutely magic version of Let's Dance on this record too. And M. Ward has a new album called Think of Spring, which came out this month. Right, what's next? Ah, let's do Songs from Under the Stairs. Songs from Under the Stairs. So this week... I picked a song from 2002. Let's flash back to 2002 then for a minute for some completely non-comprehensive facts about what was going on 18 years ago. In 2002, Apple released its second generation iPod, which held, wait for it, a mind-blowing 20 gigs of storage on it. The first ever camera phone was released in the States, (laughs) <laughs> and the world was never the same again. In movies, there were some good movies in 2002. 24-Hour Party People, Solaris, the Clooney one, not the Tarkovsky one, for any film nerds listening. Punch Drunk Love, one of my all-time favorite films with Adam Sandler and Emily Watson. Beck's Sea Change came out. There we go, keeping the nautical theme going tenuously. Also, the Flaming Lips brought out Yashini Battles with Pink Robots. The track I'm going to play you is The Bees from their debut album, Sunshine Hit Me. And the track is called Punch Bag. It has an amazing cover, this CD. I'm just looking at it here. It has a beautifully pink graphic cover with all these line drawings of Mexican wrestlers. I don't know what time of year this album came out, but for me, it's a summer album. The album just feels like it's filled with summer. Now it's that time of the evening where we do the part of the show that has the worst ident on radio. Songs from under the stairs. So this week I'm going to talk a little bit about 
going to America for the first time, which happened for me in 1998, and arriving in the back of a yellow cab into New York City in the nighttime. I went over there to do a film. I was 22 years of age, actually with the aforementioned Barry Ward, my good pal, who wasn't even 18. And it was just an intoxicating and very, very happy time. And when you're in New York at the beginning of a career or beginning of your life, it feels like New York is the only place to start that journey. I was listening to lots of different music at the time. A lot of Beastie Boys, actually. I'll play some Beastie Boys next week. But this particular album was on my CD Walkman a lot. And it's a track by Rufus Wainwright who actually is another Canadian artist. There's definitely something about the music that Canada produces and me. We just click. And the track I'm going to play you is Imaginary Love, which is the closing track from his self-titled album. And I know every single lyric of every song on this record. I remember thinking that the songs were so sophisticated and so open and brave and really, really moving. And his voice was unlike anything that I'd heard before. I've seen him in concert Many times, I think myself and Rufus Wainwright are kind of the same vintage. So it feels like we've gotten older together. <laughs> but the music remains really, really young on this particular track. Here you go. This is Imaginary Love. Every kind of love. Imaginary love to start with. Guess that can explain the rain, waiting, walking game. Schubert busts my brain to start.
now it's time for the very last songs from under the stairs this is the last time we're gonna hear this gloriously excruciating ident songs from under the stairs so the track i've picked this week is from frank zappa now i've said many times in interviews and on the radio that i am a frank zappa fan i should probably qualify that there was a period from my mid-teens to my early 20s where I was completely fascinated by Zappa as a musician and as a person because he was such an amazing contradiction and he was so fearless and so rigorous. A few facts about Zappa. He never drank, he never smoked, he hated hippies, he hated dropouts, yet he became famous during that period in the late 60s and the 70s and kind of got lumped into that movement. In my mind, he's one of the greatest guitar players of all time, but who also happened to be a self-taught composer. He was an advocate for free speech, for education, for political participation, for the abolition of censorship. In 1988, he had registration boots at his concerts. Another Zappa fact, he was friends with Captain Beefheart since they were at high school, and he produced Trout Mask Replica, Beefheart's iconic record and I remember seeing him on the BBC for the first time in about 1993 1994 with my brother and that was the beginning of our obsession and we used to play cassettes of Zappa in the car on long journeys with my poor parents at like uh, turned up to 10 and my parents in fairness to them never asked us to turn it down Zappa's output was phenomenal. He put out 113 studio albums in his life. Now not all of it was for me. I kind of loved the novelty, funny stuff when I was younger. I'm not really into that now. And I could never quite fully get my head around the avant-garde orchestral stuff. I'm just clearly not that sophisticated. But I love, love his instrumental guitar pieces, particularly earlier albums like Hot Rats, Wacka Jawaka, Overnight Sensation, Apostrophe. And here's what I think. I think we will always need artists that are brave and uncompromising. And if they happen to be a genius, then that is a bonus. And I reckon Zappa was all three of those things. Now, before you hear this track, you're going to hear some archive from the man himself on why he became a musician. And then you're going to hear Sofa Number no. 1, which is from One Size Fits All. Well, I got into it for reasons that are quite different than what most people have for going into the music business. Most people say, I'm going to be a star and I'm going to uh, have all these girls chasing me all over the place. And because there is a mirror in my house, I knew that that was not <laughs> going to be the case for me. And uh, after shaving my face for all those years, I was convinced that I'd better have another reason for going into the music business. And so I found one. It was because I loved music. And I also happen to like science, and science is what goes on in the recording studio. Mm -hmm. 